If you're interested in exploring the crown of the continent, be sure to watch this video covering a number of useful facts and tips about Glacier National Park before you go. After recently making my second trip to Glacier National Park, it easily remains one of my all-time favorite places in the United States. I've spent countless hours researching, planning, and experiencing the park firsthand, and this is a list of things I wish I would have known before visiting. First, let's cover where Glacier National Park is located. The park is located in the northwestern region of Montana near the Canadian border. The nearest towns to the park are Kalispell, Whitefish, and Bath. Kalispell is home to the region's primary airport, which makes it the best jumping off point for visitors outside of driving distance. The park boundaries span two separate sub-ranges of the Rocky Mountains and over one million acres. And a trip to the park will allow visitors to see glaciers, forests, turquoise lakes, wildlife, and enjoy some of the best hiking trails in the country. So what is the best town to stay in when visiting Glacier National Park? Whitefish in the surrounding area on the western side of the park will have the most lodging options. This is also where you'll find the highest concentrations of restaurants, activities, bars, and things of that nature. It's not the cheapest area to stay, but in general, this is a pretty expensive area to visit during the summer season. If you're on a budget, try looking around Kalispell or secure campsite reservations well in advance. Another not so friendly budget option, but my personal favorite, is to secure lodging within the park itself. Glacier National Park is home to a handful of hotels that are spread throughout the park. These hotels usually sell out a full year in advance, so you'll need to secure a reservation as soon as they become available. I'd recommend calling these hotels around 12 months prior to your target travel dates. During my last visit to the park, we stayed at Many Glacier Hotel, which is located in the Many Glacier area on the eastern side of the park. The hotel has a great restaurant, balconies with views of Grinnell Point, and access to Swift Current Lake for canoe rentals and more. If you're an avid hiker and looking for something really off the grid, consider hiking the Highline Trail and spending the night at Granite Park Chalet for a truly unforgettable mountain experience. Next up, let's discuss how many days you should spend visiting Glacier National Park. In my opinion, you should spend no less than three full days visiting Glacier National Park, which will really only give you a taste of what the crown of the continent has to offer. And I'd really encourage you to spend at least five days in the area. Five days will allow you enough time to attempt at least one premier hike in each area of the park. If you're an outdoor enthusiast or an avid hiker like me, you could easily spend a week here and still not get through all the great hiking options. Between my two visits to Glacier National Park, I've spent about 10 days in the area and I still have a number of things on my to-do list for a future trip. Since it can take a significant amount of time to drive across the entire park, consider breaking up your stay at one or more hotels, split between different areas to cut down on driving time. Next up, you need to understand how the National Park Time Entry Reservation System works. First off, you'll need to create an account at nps.gov, which will allow you to make a timed entry reservation. However, these reservation slots are very limited and tend to sell out almost immediately after becoming available. If you've never had to make a reservation at a national park that requires timed entry reservations, I highly recommend reading the guide I published on my blog walking you through that process. Not only will it walk you through the process, but I also highlight some entry hacks if you find yourselves in a pinch after all the reservation slots have already sold out. I'll include links to the National Park Service registration page as well as my guide in the video description below, so be sure to check those out after you're done watching this video. Their process is constantly evolving, but as of now, different sections of Glacier National Park require separate reservations to access. The different areas of the park are going to the Sun Road, Many Glacier, to Medicine, and North Fork. I cannot emphasize enough that you will need a separate reservation to access each area of the park. There are some great hikes located in the Many Glacier area, such as Iceberg and Grinnell Lake, while other super popular hikes like the Highline Trail or Avalanche Lake are located along going to the Sun Road. Given how dispersed some of the best activities are, you'll probably need more than one reservation type. Next up, let's discuss a few essential pieces of hiking gear you'll want to pack for your trip. There are certain outdoor essentials that every visitor of the park should have. This includes basic items like sturdy hiking boots, sunscreen, water, and food. Generally speaking, there isn't anywhere to purchase food, water, or to refuel your vehicle inside the park, and it can take hours to cross going to the Sun Road, so you need to plan accordingly. Bear spray is an essential item to have, easily accessible if you're doing any hiking during your visit. You can purchase or rent bear spray from many outdoor and general merchandise shops in the town surrounding Glacier National Park. For travelers flying into Kalispell, there's a shop inside the airport near baggage claim where you can rent bear spray. During 
my last visit to the park, we had two separate bear encounters and I came within seconds of having to use it in both situations. If you're doing any longer day hikes during your visit, you'll want to do some additional preparation. While most of the trails in the park are well maintained, there are a lot of steep sections throughout the park and trekking poles can make the journey up easier while saving your knees on the way back down. One resource I'd recommend using to ensure you haven't missed any hiking items is my complete day hike packing list. I'll include a link to that in the video description below for you to check out later. Also, be thoughtful about how you're using GPS to navigate through the park. Cellular service throughout the area is extremely limited, so anything past basic GPS navigation cannot be relied on. Download maps and do any activity research before entering the park. All Trails is a great resource for finding trailheads, discovering new hikes, and downloading offline hiking maps. I'll leave a link to that below as well. The next topic we're going to cover in this video is wildlife. One of the most amazing parts of visiting Glacier National Park is the possibility of encountering wildlife, both small and large. Over the span of my two visits to the park, I've encountered bighorn sheep, mountain goats, wolves, moose, marmots, and even had a couple of way too close bear encounters. If you're keen on spotting wildlife during your visit, many glacier and Logan's Pass are two prime areas to look. While the opportunity to encounter wildlife in the park is very exciting, with this opportunity also comes a lot of responsibility. The first and most important rule is that anytime you spot wildlife, be sure to keep your distance. As a reminder, these are wild animals and they can act unpredictably. Don't be that cringe-worthy guest trying to take a selfie with a moose. I cannot emphasize enough that there is an active bear population in Glacier National Park, so be sure to brush up on bear safety guidelines provided by the National Park Service. These tips help to stay safe during two different encounters we had, and I'll leave a link to those guidelines in the video description as well. Next up, let's discuss one of the most important important things to know, which is when is the best time of year to visit Glacier National Park? In my opinion, the best time of year to visit the park is summer between mid-July and late August. This is when temperatures are the warmest and it ensures that snow has melted from higher elevation trails and that snow has been cleared from going to the Sun Road. If you arrive too early in the summer season, going to the Sun Road may still be closed to the public, which is the only road that provides access to Logan's Pass. During my first trip to the park, going to the Sun Road was closed until mid-July and we nearly missed out on Logan's Pass activities altogether. If you plan your visit to the park too early in the season, you might miss out on some of the best hiking in the park. There's also a chance that some trails at higher elevations will still be obstructed by snow bridges if you visit too early in the summer. During my last visit, we completely missed out on hiking to Grinnell Glacier because the trail was still blocked by snow, even though it was the last weekend in July. While summer is the best time of year to visit the park, it's also the busiest, which means fierce competition for timed entry reservations, campgrounds, and lodging. Flights will be more expensive and rental cars may even sell out, so you need to plan your travels even further in advance than you normally would. Yes, rental cars can completely sell out during this time of year, so don't wait to book one until the last minute. If you've never tried the car sharing app called Turo before, you might want to consider downloading it for this trip. It's like the Airbnb of running cars, and it saved us some serious coin during our last trip. All things considered, if you want to ensure the greatest odds of accessibility in the park, I'd suggest visiting during early August. It will be peak season, which can mean crowds and higher costs, but this should ensure that you can access all of the best areas of the park. If you don't mind waking up early, arriving at popular trailheads first thing in the morning is a great way to experience the park without the crowds and parking headaches. Speaking of crowds, that's the next topic we'll cover. Glacier National Park has a reputation for its difficulty securing parking at popular trailheads and for heavy traffic along going through the Sun Road. Sometimes this is just unavoidable, but you can avoid most of these issues by simply getting an early start to your day. Decide which hikes are most important to you and set your schedule to attempt those first thing in the morning, which usually means arriving to the trailhead by 7 a.m. This should ensure you snag a coveted parking spot, face fewer crowds on the trail itself, and avoid hiking during the hottest part of the day. Logan's Pass and Many Glacier are two of the busiest sections of the park. If you're attempting a hike in either area, I'd highly recommend arriving to these areas by 7 a.m. It can be really crowded attempting to visit either area by midday. Not only does this help with parking, but it really helps you avoid excess crowds along the trails. After all, part of hiking in the mountains is about getting away and enjoying some peace and quiet. The park does tend to slow down in the late afternoon or early evening, but it can be difficult to complete some of the longer hikes during this time frame with adequate sunlight. If you're attempting a hike late in the afternoon, make sure you have a headlamp or flashlight in case you're stuck out after dark. Another important thing to know during your trip to Glacier National Park is that the park service offers a free shuttle service to get around the park. The shuttle system drops off and picks up at many of the most popular points of interest throughout Glacier National Park. For most visitors, the best way to utilize the system is by parking at either the Apgar Village Visitor Center on the west 
west side or at the St. Mary Visitor Center on the east side of the park. From there, you can catch a shuttle that will take you all the way to Logan's Pass with plenty of stops along the way. This can also be a great solution for anyone that's uncomfortable driving along going to the Sun Road, which can be narrow and windy with steep drop-offs at some parts of it. Just be mindful that during summer season, at peak times of the day, there can be lines to board the shuttle at certain spots. It isn't uncommon to spend 15 to 30 minutes waiting to catch a shuttle during these times. Keep in mind that the Park Service shuttles are different than the red bus tours you'll also see navigating the park. The significance of these red touring buses dates back to the 1930s. These tours come with a knowledgeable guide and panoramic windows that make it easy for taking in the epic mountain views. Travelers interested in the red bus tours can choose from options departing from the western or eastern sides of the park. Just be mindful that these tours sell out regularly so the further out you can reserve a seat the better. Next up, I want to cover some of the boat tour options available in Glacier National Park. The Glacier Park Boat Company offers guided options at Apgar on Lake McDonald, St. Mary, Two Medicine, and Many Glacier. The best way to book one of these tours is directly through the Glacier Park Boat Company's website. I'll be sure to include a link to their website in the video description below if you're interested in learning more. If this is an activity you'd like to do during your visit, I highly recommend booking far in advance. While some of the tours offer standby options in the event a rider no-shows, most tours will completely sell out. Don't expect to show up and grab a last minute seat. Another thing to know when visiting Glacier National Park is that you can rent canoes and get out on the water. This is a great option to enjoy Lake McDonald on the west side of the park or Swift Current Lake, which resides in the Many Glacier area of the park. During our visit, we rented a canoe from the Many Glacier Hotel and spent a couple of hours out on Swift Current Lake. You don't need to be a guest at Many Glacier Hotel in order to rent a canoe and the rentals are on a first come first serve basis. The picnic we had from Grinnell Point was one of my favorite highlights from our trip and the best way to reach the beach is by canoe. The next thing to remember when visiting Glacier National Park is that wildfires can affect your visit. Summer season and especially late summer is wildfire season in Glacier National Park. If conditions are extremely dry, campfires within the park may be restricted. This is more of an issue if you plan to camp within the park during your stay. If there are active wildfires in the park, it could result in certain areas being closed to the public. It's always advisable to check park conditions with the National Park Service each day during your visit. Even if there aren't wildfires or dry conditions in Glacier National Park, smoke from other wildfires in the region can drift through and cause hazy conditions and poor air quality. In extreme instances that poor air quality and lack of visibility can negatively impact hiking conditions. Next up, let's talk about restroom facilities in the park. You might actually be surprised at how widely available restrooms are in Glacier National Park. Will they be the nicest facilities you've ever used? Probably not. You are off in the mountains after all. But for the most part, there's a popular trailhead along Going to the Sun Road every several miles or so, and with each major trailhead, there's usually a restroom. There's even a decent amount of pit toilets out along many of the trails. Pit toilets are one-person outhouses that lock from the exterior, and they can be quite handy in a pinch. As a pro tip, if the pit toilet is unlocked from the outside, it means there's someone on the inside. When you're finished up using one, lock it back up to ensure wildlife doesn't get inside. Now, I touched on our next topic briefly earlier in the video, but I want to emphasize the lack of cellular service in the park. Visitors should not expect to have reliable phone, messaging, internet, or even GPS service when navigating the park. It's recommended that you download maps and plan your route before entering the park. Service can be so spotty that even GPS navigation is unreliable. Some of the more densely populated areas in the park and high points, such as Logan's Pass, may provide limited cell phone coverage, but you should plan to be without your phone for much of the day during your visit. Next up, I'm sad to report that your pet is generally not welcome in Glacier National Park. Pets are not allowed on any of the park transportation systems or inside any park building. In general, pets are not allowed on any of the popular hiking trails either. There are a few exceptions to this rule as leash pets are allowed in parking lots, roads, and certain campgrounds, but you'll need to check with the National Park Service on any specific exceptions. Given the restrictions and the abundance of wildlife in the park, including bears, it's probably best you leave your furry friend at home for their own safety. The next thing I recommend for travelers is to familiarize themselves with the leave no trace principles before for exploring Glacier National Park. It's important to help preserve the beauty of the crown of the continent for future generations to enjoy. Avoid leaving marked trails, pick up any waste you create, and never take plants, rocks, or other objects you find during your adventures. Be sure to keep a safe distance from wildlife and be courteous to other hikers you encounter on the trails. These are just a few of the most important leave no trace principles, which I recommend reviewing before your visit, and I'll include a link to the full list in the video description, along with some of the other resources I mentioned throughout the video. I hope this list of Glacier National Park 
important facts and tips serves you well in planning your trip to the park. Feel free to reach out on social media or drop a comment below if you have any specific questions that went unanswered in this video. Don't forget to check out some of my other Glacier National Park guides that are available on my blog. I've included links to those in the description as well for your convenience. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to drop a like and subscribe so you don't miss out on any future travel guides that I published. I'm Wes Murgard with WorkRemotelyLiveRemotely.com and thanks for watching.